Let's do it. Super, super excited. Good morning, everyone. Good morning, good morning, good morning. Happy Thursday to everyone. We want to welcome you to Northeastern University. Uh, my name is Kenyatta Simmons. Hold your applause, please. <laughs> Just joking. Uh, I am the Assistant Director of Recruitment, and I work under the Division of Enrollment Management. I am a, an admissions recruiter for the university in general, and we're super excited today to welcome you to Northeastern University and our presentation on environmental science and policy. I'm also excited to have my favorite co-laborer. Her name is Sky Osborne. She is the best, I mean, the absolute best college success manager. And our job today is to actually support. Uh, and so we're gonna be in the background today asking any questions. So feel free to put any questions in the chat and we'll do all those things. Before we get started, I'd ask that you guys would put in the chat where you are calling from, where you're watching from, where you're Zooming from, what part of the world are you in? I'm in Houston, Texas. Where are you? Are you in Illinois? Are you in Florida? Are you in India? Where are you watching us from this morning? So put that in the chat this morning. We would love to know where you are watching us from. As you guys know, Northeastern is campuses everywhere, from Boston to Vancouver to Miami to London to California. And so we're excited today to bring this presentation on environmental science and policy. Thank you, Dr. Dick Renner, for coming. And he, I'm going to turn the, uh, the mantle over to him. And he's going to talk about all the good things. And watch this. And feel free to put your questions in the chat. And also stick around to the end because we do have uh, some time at the end of the presentation today uh, for some Q&A sessions as well, too. So stick around to the end if you have a question directly. Uh, we can do that. All right. Doc, they're all yours, sir. All right. Awesome. Thank you, Kenetta. It's great to be here. Thanks, everyone, for tuning in. I am going to be talking about the ESP program, but I'm going to try to carve out a good okay. amount of space for uh, Q&A at the end because uh, I've, I've put on a number of these and there are often a lot of very specific questions. So happy to dig into that. Uh, but let's talk about the program first and we'll kind of cover the the broad strokes. All right, are you guys seeing that? I can't tell. Yes, yes sir, Doc, we can see it. Okay, great. All right, so just waiting for my screen to move here. Okay, here we go. All right, so today we'll talk about the ESP program, Environmental Science and Policy. We'll talk about what the program is designed for, what we focus on, what the benefits of the program are, how the program is structured, the requirements of the program, uh, the co-op opportunities that we have in Northeastern, placement rates once you graduate, and then we'll move on to Q&A after that. All right, so the ESP program is a professional master's program. The, the objectives are all focused around what a master's program, uh, a professional master's program is about. So exploring career options and pointing you out in, or pointing you into the right direction. Many of our students who are thinking about grad school or are actually in grad school are a little nervous because they don't know exactly what they want to do. So one of the big goals for us is to give you a lot of perspective and a lot of exposure to different areas so that you can further uh, delve into the specific areas that, that you want to go into. Another objective is to develop professional and career skills, so make you marketable, help you get the career uh, and the position that you're, you're interested in. Uh, next is to cultivate skills and abilities to make you confident in your career skills. So once you get into the position, we want you to have the abilities to do your job effectively uh, and efficiently. Uh, of course, networking is a huge component of, of your career. And we really do a lot of work to help you expand your network, connect you with alumni, connect you with current students, connect you with our professional network uh, in the Boston area and beyond. And so we put a lot of emphasis in that. And maybe most importantly is to get you a job, to assist in, in the job, uh, getting a job that you're interested in. We'll talk about kind of all these things. 
Okay, so what are the benefits of the ESP program? Uh, so there are a bunch, but here are some of the, the biggies and some of the things that students tell us that they, they like most about the program. So number one, and I think kind of the, the coolest part about the environmental science and pro policy program is it's hyper customizable. Uh, it is really designed to be flexible so that you can dig into the specific focus area that you want to and really cultivate uh, your skills and abilities and focus in that area. Uh, number two, and related to number one, is we have just a ton of co courses that you have uh, the opportunity to take. So over 140 core courses in the program. Uh, one of the problems with the program is that you can only take nine courses or you only need nine courses to graduate. So you have to decide between nine courses within 140. So that can be a challenge, but uh, part of my role is to work with you individually to set up a course plan. And so we dig into that, help you think about what courses are going to be the most useful, maybe which ones would be fun too, um, and really uh, carve out a plan based on the, those courses. Number three is... Uh, really flexible course structure. So other programs may have a very prescriptive course structure where they say you have to do this and you have to take this and this, this and that. There are a few classes that we uh, require you to take, but the, the program overall is really, really flexible. So you can sp take specific courses that you wanna take instead of the courses that we say you have to take. Number four is we put a lot of emphasis on skills building and career development. And so these are things that are go beyond the classroom. There's a lot of emphasis on connecting students with their cohort. We believe that making connections is the beginning of networking. So we really wanna do that and set you up uh, for both enjoyment socially, uh, but then once you move into the career world, all those connections that you have in school turn into professional connections as well. And they often will, will yield some interesting results. Uh, number five, we have an optional graduate co-op. So you can choose to do this. You don't have to do it if you don't want to, and you don't have to decide whether you want to do it or not until later on in the program. Uh, but many students find a co-op really, really useful uh, to get to the direction that they want to go or further expand their career skills in the workspace. And we'll talk about that more uh, in a little bit. And then number six, excellent job placement rates. So we have phenomenal job placement rates, and I'll, I'll talk about that as well once, once we get down to that spot. Okay, so let's talk about the program uh, focus and job sectors. So the ESP program, like I mentioned previously, is, is really flexible, and it allows you to kind of dig into specific areas that you're interested in. And that means that we have people going in a lot of di different directions. We also have people coming from a lot of different directions. We have people coming from environmental science and ecology, obviously, uh, but also the policy world, um, some of the other sciences like geology and meteorology and, and you name it. We also have people coming from health sciences that are interested in kind of environmental health. We have people coming from maybe the business world interested in sustainability and ESG. Uh, and those people kind of funnel into our program. So you have a lot of cross-disciplinary -dis interactions, which is really cool, but it also allows you um, to interact with those people and then funnel back out. And so we have people interested and in, uh, successfully going into fields, including ecology, environmental science, sustainability, food systems, climate change, uh, policy, of course, and then many, many other directions. So, those positions are basically encompassed in basically all of the different job sectors that are out there. So that includes the uh, federal, state, local government, um, NGOs, both large and small, consulting, uh, the corporate world. And even though the ESP program is not really designed to be a feeder into PhD programs, we have quite a few people that have been successful uh, getting into PhD programs after they graduate from the ESP program. Okay, one of the really interesting things and probably really unique things about the ESP program is that it has a, a, a dual structure. And what that means is that uh, the program sits both with, in two different colleges, the College of Science uh, and then the College of Social Sciences in, in Humanities. Um, let's see, and so within the College of Science, uh, the program sits 
most squarely within the Department of Marine and Environmental Sciences, that's MES, and with the College of Social Sciences and Humanities, the program sits within the policy school. Uh, so that's a school of public policy and urban affairs. You have access as a student of ESP to all of the courses available in the, the science school and the policy school uh, and access to all faculty as well. So what that means is you can interact with them uh, within courses, but also individually, uh, you can do research with them uh, and really the sky is the limit. So uh, a ton of different people to work on and that faculty encompasses people ranging from ecologists, uh, environmental scientists, social scientists, uh, policy analysts, policy scientists, uh, environmental psychologists and everybody in between. So just a really broad array of the different people that you can work with in, in different uh, types of environments. All right, uh, in terms of how the program is laid out, uh, there are 36 credits required to graduate. And at Northeastern, almost every class is four credits. So that means that there's nine classes to graduate overall. Uh, the standard, well, so part-time is one class and full-time is two classes or three classes. No one ever takes four classes or more because that's just too much work. Uh, the standard timeline, if you're taking three classes per semester, is three semesters to graduate or a year and a half. So it's a pretty quick turnaround uh, and definitely faster than if you were in a thesis-based master's program. If you choose to do the co-op, uh, which you don't have to really decide on until your second semester, uh, but if you choose to do your co-op, then it's, it would take four semesters to graduate. Uh, for professional students, when we have quite a few professional students, so students that come to the program but also are working at the same time, I think that there's some some noise um, coming from someone. Could, for those people that are just tuning in, could you please mute uh, your your audio? That would yes, I believe it's Faith. If if Faith is on here, I've asked her to mute herself. I'm having a little trouble doing so on my end, but Faith, if you're here. You could please mute yourself. All right, thank you, Sky. So professional students, um, and like I mentioned, we have quite a few. Uh, professional students are able to take part-time classes, so one class a semester. Uh, they can take two if they want, which is called, considered full-time, and they can just go back and forth uh, really easily. And we do have quite a few online classes, which makes it much easier for professional students to both work full time and then take classes. Many of those online classes are offered at night and we also have quite a few uh, in-person classes offered at night as well. So that really helps out professional students. Okay, in terms of program requirements, let's kind of dig into the weeds here and explore how the program actually works. So I mentioned 36 credits to graduate or nine classes. So within that nine class uh, lineup, we have uh, three different ma main categories uh, of classes uh, that you're required to take, and then you have flexibility within those categories to select the courses that you want. So the first category are the ESP seminars, and there are two seminars here. These are the only two classes that are required, uh, and one is a policy seminar, and the other one is the environmental science seminar, and I, I take or I teach the environmental science seminar. These are really great seminars. They're specifically for ESP students. So everyone in your cohort will be in these, in these, in these seminars. Uh, so you'll be with your cohort in a class um, for an entire year. And we focus on a lot of different areas uh, within these seminars. So they're basically kind of like foundational graduate courses. So we cover a lot of ground. We dig into a lot of areas. We also bring in a lot of professionals, like high level professionals, to talk about their careers, talk about the state of the science within that subject area, uh, and potentially network with you if, you, if you're interested. Uh, and it is a really great way to get some exposure to those different areas, to see people in the field, to hear what it's really like to work there. They often talk about how they broke into the field, which sometimes it seems kind of a mysterious uh, question about how, how do you actually like get into the Nature Conservancy or, or US EPA or, or other, you know, highly sought after uh, different work environments. So it's a really great way to get exposure to the that career side of things. But we also do a lot of uh, cohort cohesion uh, events and kind of activities, both in the seminar and then outside of the seminars as well. Uh, and that really helps to, to generate satisfaction among 
students, uh, you know, just developing kind of a, a group of, of friends. Uh, but then, like I said previously, uh, that helps to develop a network that once you go out into the world, you have like this, this group of people that are also going out, you know, very bright, motivated, capable people uh, that will be in really cool positions and you have the opportunity to you know, connect with them in the future. And as long as I'm talking about that, I should mention that we have a really active uh, and friendly uh, uh, alumni group. And when people come into the program, I'd say, uh, we're, we'd love to have you here, take advantage of the alumni that are out there. And we are really hoping that when you graduate, you will be a supportive alumni as well for, for students coming to the program. And we've had uh, a bunch of alumni helping out students, getting jobs and getting into really interesting positions. So um, it's a really great resource that we continue to expand with each semester. Okay, so that was the first, first category of requirements. The second category are skills courses. Uh, and so skills courses are courses that are maybe quantitative or give you a skill that you can put like as a bullet on your resume or something like that. Uh, and within skills courses, the requirement here is to take one from the Department of Marine and Environmental Sciences and then one from the policy school. And I'll, I'll go into these in a little bit, but I want to just lay out the course or the, the requirements here first. Uh, the third category of requirements are elective courses. And so this is the same format. Um, we're requiring you to take at least one additional course within the science and one additional course within the policy school. And there are a ton to choose from. So like I mentioned previously, the real challenge is figuring out which one you actually are gonna take uh, within that giant list. Uh, and then fourth is to take, to just round it out to nine classes, to, to take three additional classes. And that can be anything in this list and more, and I'll talk about that as well. Okay, so what classes can you choose from? So this is the list of the skills courses uh, in MES, Marine Environmental Science on the left and the policy courses on, on the right. Uh, and there's some crossover here. So sometimes people are a little bit terrified of policy. Uh, if you're terrified of policy, you could take GIS in the policy school that would reduce your, your policy exposure. Some people wanna go all in on policy and that's totally fine as well. I and mean, you can totally do that as well. So a, a lot of different uh, possibilities here ranging from climate change related topics, uh, planning related topics, GIS related topics, social science related topics, really quantitative type stuff. Uh, and then there's a few other interesting classes too, like grant writing, uh, budget management, and things like that. So uh, it's really a, a broad range of, of options that you have for, for these two required classes. And then over in the electives group, I have a slide for both marine environmental science and then the next one is for policy. So these are all the courses uh, as of last year that you could take uh, within marine environmental science to satisfy your electives. So um, quite a few and we continue to, to add additional classes. So for example, we pulled ESP students uh, three years ago on which classes that they would love to take that they're not currently uh, being offered. And there was kind of a resounding um, emphasis on climate change issues, but kind of implementation uh, and practice of climate change, mitigation, adaptation, uh, resilience, and things like that. So we designed this course right here, ENVR 5800 Climate Adaptation and Nature-Based Solutions. We rolled it out this past year, uh, and it was it's an awesome course, and people were really excited, and uh, that's going to be one of our core courses going forward. We also rolled out urban ecology, uh, streams and watershed ecology, and we just continue to add courses as we see the, the need arise for those courses. Oh, let me just say one more thing as well. So um, I don't know if I have it. Oh, yes. So within the science school, there is also uh, a, an option to do research, ENVR 5984. Um, like I said, you don't have to do research, but if you want to do research, you're free to do that. How that would work is you reach out to faculty that are doing cool work that aligns with your interests. Uh, you ask if they have any availability, and if, as long as they're not on sabbatical or already are overcommitted, uh, they will most likely uh, take you on, and then it's up to you to decide what your project is going to look like, uh, what the deliverables and the timeline will be, uh, and then from there, uh, the, the sky is the limit. All right, and then this is over in the policy school, so there are a ton of classes here as well. Um, cla uh, 
classwork going or focusing on climate change issues, equity issues, food systems, urban systems, obviously, since that's in the name of the, of the department, uh, and, and many other areas. And you also have the opportunity to do research in the policy school as well. We have a few kind of core faculty that do a lot of research with students uh, and do some really interesting work. Uh, so uh, you can choose to do that. And even if you don't know if you want to do that, you can you know wait till you get into the program and think about who you want to work with. And then you can make decisions about that uh, later on uh, as you're working through the program. Okay, so let's summarize nine classes total, two are seminar courses, two are skills courses, two are electives, and then there are these three general electives. So the three general electives uh, are just anything that you really want to do. So most students will fill those with um, some of the some of the policies, some of the science courses that we spoke about. But there are some people going into interesting directions and they could benefit from coursework that lays outside of the policy school or environmental science. So for those last three courses, you're free to take uh, coursework as long as a graduate class in any Northeastern department. So that it could include sociology, economics, psychology, engineering, communications, philosophy, landscape, architecture, business, international business, health science, the law school. Uh, we have a ton of other departments too. So. Um, why do we make this available to students? Well, we have people doing some interesting stuff. So for example, we have someone interested in sustainability of fashion. She took coursework that I've just spoke about, but she's also taking coursework in the art school or in textiles. And so we could have never really anticipated that she would or someone would be taking you know, sustainability of fashion focused uh, but because we design the flexibility into the program, people can choose to kind of cultivate directions that we hadn't even really thought about. Okay, you have the option, as I previously mentioned, to do a co-op um, and you don't have to decide until your second semester. So you can kind of think about it and see what, um, how it's worked for other students as well. But many people are drawn to ESP in Northeastern because of the co-op program. So what is the co-op program? Co-op is essentially a curated internship program. So it's six months long. You work with a, a business or a governmental entity or an NGO uh, doing something that is within your interest area in your, your future career. Uh, so it could the sky is really the limit. It could be a lot of different things. It's six months long. Uh, the benefits is that you are in this position doing a job. You're not there for just a summer in which time, like the summer fl flies, you know, summer internships fly by really fast. So you often don't have enough time to really like dig in and, and you know, see a project through. Um, so a six month intern or a six month co-op allows you to really be there long enough to feel like you get a sense of the place, you get a sense of the people, you can actually get some work done um, and you have a lot of networking opportunities. And if you're lucky, some uh, co-op uh, people or students are offered a position after they graduate. So it could be the opportunity to you know, go directly into work. One other cool thing is when I look at people's resumes um, and they've done a co-op, Unless they specifically say a co-op, it's kind of hard to tell that it's not a professional position. And so if you don't have a lot of things on your resume directly related to the, to the career direction that you, you're going in, uh, having that co-op on your resume uh, can really beef it up and give people um, more perspective of, of the skills and abilities that you have. Uh, one other cool thing about co-op is that you're considered a full-time student when you're on co-op, but you don't have to pay any uh, tuition during that time. All co-ops are paid. The graduate co-ops pay somewhere between a minimum of $18 an hour, and some go all the way up to 35 So that can be a decent amount of money for people. Um, yeah, and, and so it really is kind of a, a great way to get exposure to the career area that you're interested in. The way that would work, so this table on the right kind of shows your schedule if you do go on a co-op. So if you're a full-time student, uh, presumably coming in in the fall, you would take three classes. 
In the spring, you would take three additional classes. We also have a, a co-op development course. Uh, you do a whole bunch of things in this course. It's a free course, it's zero credits. It's a light lift, so it's, it doesn't uh, conflict with the other classes. And you, we have a co-op coordinator who's dedicated to the program. She's really fantastic. And you would work with this person, Kristen, to find a co-op. Some people are interested in career areas that lie outside of whatever co-ops are, are currently in existence. And so then you have the opportunity to do two, one of two different things. You could work with Kristen to find a company out there that's uh, maybe offering a, a term position uh, or maybe a seasonal position. And Kristen can reach out to them and develop or turn that position potentially into a co-op. Uh, and then the second possibility is that you can self-develop a co-op where you see people, a company or an organization that aligns with your interests. Um, you can reach out to them and Kristen can help you in that process and you can actually create a co-op that didn't exist. Uh, so sometimes those one-off co-ops are, are the best co-ops because they're really highly focused with uh, on your specific interests. All right, so you would do that in the springtime and then in the summer there's two terms. Summer term one goes from essentially June to July or May to July. Um, you could take classes during that time if you wanted. And then the co-op would start in the middle of July. Um, you could take a class during that time if it didn't conflict with the co-op. Uh, and then in the fall, you would presumably be uh, full-time in the co-op again. Uh, you could take an evening class if you wanted, or if there was flexibility in the co-op, you could take a class there as well. And then you would come back and do three classes for your last semester, and then you graduate. Okay, so what types of co-ops are out there? There are a ton. Northeastern really is known uh, for experiential education and the co-op is kind of that flagship um, offering. And all undergrads do at least one co-op, most do two. So there are thousands and thousands of co-ops to choose from. So this is just a tiny little blip uh, of, of possibilities um, and there's lots more out there. Um, so these are co-ops that people have done in the past. So people working um, for Northeastern itself, people working for other universities like MIT and Harvard, people working for um, local government, uh, and really the sky is the limit. Just tons of different opportunities out there. Okay, so many people ask, all right, so all this sounds great, but what what happens in the end? What Where do people go? what are the job placement rates? And I love this question because we have an awesome answer. So people more or less uh, go into almost like equally into the, the government, governmental job sectors, into large and small NGOs and into the consulting and corporate world. So it's almost like a third, third, a third uh, for some reason. Um, and then we do have a number of people that go into PhD programs. What is the timing of that? So this is where it kind of gets exciting. So um, students, we found, so this is as of just a few months ago when this data just came out. So about a third of students have a job before they graduate, which is fantastic. Um, two thirds of students or a little over two thirds of students have jobs within three months of graduating. So that's the great majority. And then the great, great majority over 85% of students have jobs within six months. And these are jobs specifically within the focus area that these students are interested in. So um, we are really uh, successful at getting students into the de desired career direction and positions that, that they're hoping for. All right, so this was just a brief presentation because I really want to leave a lot of time for Q and A. Um, but I am more than happy to, to after this presentation at some point, meet up with you individually if you want to talk specifically about how the program would work for you. If that's of interest to you, don't hesitate to reach out. Here's my email address. Shoot me an email, and we'll find a time to meet up. Um, don't hesitate to shoot me an email and ask questions about anything. I'm really happy to do that. Um, but as long as we have lots of time, uh, I'd be happy to take questions as well now. So thanks very much for listening and let's open it up for some Q and A. Uh, 
All right, so you can either ask me directly or, or shoot your Q and A or questions into the to the chat box, and we'll answer them uh, as you kind of come up with them. Yeah, first one we have here. Um, what are the application requirements? Good question. Uh, I think I actually have a slide on this. So. Um, letter of intent so if you go to the application portal it's pretty straightforward so your letter of intent two letters of recommendation uh, i think your unofficial transcripts before you get accepted at some point you have to provide official transcripts but you don't need that um, initially um, and then if you're an international student there is a language requirement and there's a couple different ways to to satisfy that so a lot of international students actually have attended an undergraduate institution that the the mode of instruction was in English and then you don't need to you just need to demonstrate uh, I think maybe there's a process for that that um, admissions can help you out with but it's just like a little form that says um, this person took uh, attended a university that the the primary language was English and then the the language requirements are waived Oh, Sky, you're muted. Sorry. Yep, I didn't see that. Thank you. A follow up question to that is, is there anything that students can do to strengthen their application, something possibly within their um, their personal statement or anything that they can do? Well, probably, I mean, so our students generally have uh, pretty high GPAs. So, you know, Doing well in your undergraduate institution would be great. Having letters of support that are really good letters of support. So finding recommenders who um, can really talk to your skills and abilities and you, you know, who you are is really helpful. Um, but probably the, the easiest thing well, while you're applying is to, yeah, uh, really write a, a, a letter that is specifically for the ESP program, talking about your interests, what you want to get out of the program and what you'd like to do afterwards. Um, and so that really helps us to, to get a sense of who you are and what you're hoping to get out of the program so that we can you know, identify um, individuals that would complement the program. Um, another question, is there, I posted a link in here to generic scholarship, um, Northeastern information, but is there any specific scholarships um, or even employment options for students um, in the ESP program? Yes, uh, yes and no. Uh, I should not say yes so freely. So there are not, uh, the program itself does not have any specific funding mechanisms that we can offer to students. Um, and that often is somewhat problematic for international students. Uh, we don't have guaranteed TAs or RAs, um, uh, which means that we don't have like uh, tuition waivers or things like that. There are ways that people do make money in the program. Uh, so scholarships are, are great. Uh, the co-op program uh, pays fairly well. Uh, if you are a domestic student and you're doing student loans, you should definitely check the work study box. We employ one to two and maybe even three work study students every semester. And for ESP, they just do lots of ESP stuff. So like one of our students just did uh, assemble all the stats that I just told you about, about job placement rates um, and, and just things like that. Um, one of the students just helped us uh, organize our, our graduation party. Um, so pretty easy stuff and it pays well, I think $20 an hour. Um, so that's for domestic students. If you are work study eligible, uh, there's also a ton of work study opportunities on campus. It's basically just free money. Uh, so that there's opportunities in the library and other places. We, we don't really ever advertise that we have TA opportunities, but periodically we might have a TA opportunity for a section. So sometimes that that comes into play. Um, and th those are the biggies. We 
we've been, or ESP students have been pretty successful in finding fellowships. Uh, oftentimes during the summer, uh, there's a bunch of really prestigious fellowships that come out and we've had students successfully kind of navigate that process. So that, that could be another way to um, make a little money and also get some really great experience. Um, two things I just want to bring up here. One, um, there's been a couple questions about app fee waivers. So I do just want to let everybody know that there, if you have not um, submitted your application yet, COS is offering a COS webinar 2024 app fee waiver code um, for anybody that has not submitted application yet. Um, and we'll get back to questions here. Um, I'll throw two out there here. This is not a thesis-based program, correct? Yes, that's right. So not a thesis-based program. So you are not required to do research and you're not required to do a thesis. However, we do have people that are interested in doing some sort of research. And then, like I mentioned when we were talking about that, you're free to do that. Um, I took on a student, so my focus area is on beavers and I uh, beaver ecology and how they can uh, bolster resilience within aquatic ecosystems. And there was a student that was really interested in that. So I took her on. She did two credits of research in the first semester. Um, she developed her research uh, like protocol the second semester with no credits of research. Um, and then the just kind of like working with me individually. Then her third semester, she was on co-op. And then her last semester, she just graduated. She took two sem two more uh, credits of research uh, to do her analysis. And now we're just kind of like finalizing uh, some, of, some of that work right now. So, you know, that is essentially pretty similar to a thesis space program. Uh, and then we're gonna do a publication at the end. So her thesis will be a publication. And that's kind of how, many thesis-based programs are kind of going. In the old days, you would write, you do your research, you do like a 100-page paper, and then uh, which is your thesis, and then put it on a shelf and no one ever <laughs> reads it, right? Um, so that, that's not really a great model. And so people have been transitioning to doing, when, when it's a thesis program, they do a thesis that encompasses a publication and they submit that, uh, and then it will be, you know, actionable science. So we are doing... Uh, something similar for students that are interested in that type of exposure. Okay, we have a couple more in the chat here, but if anybody does want to come off camera, ask their question, feel free to raise your hand and we can get to you um, directly as well. Um, let's see what we Any have direct here. questions? Do Any students direct questions? normally take, um, one course a semester or more often do they take two? Uh, Full-time students usually take three and then you can finish in a, a year and a half. You're welcome to take two but then it's going to take you longer and if you want to take one class a semester you're free to do that but it's going to take nine semesters. So we've never had anybody do that. We've actually had some uh, professional students take one a semester, but then often they'll take two the next semester and they might like flip flop back and forth, or something like that. Um, I saw a question there about fee waivers and, and Sky kind of talked about that, but if you specifically want a, a fee waiver, reach out to either me or the graduate school with that request and we can waive that fee. It's just a matter of you just asking me and then I just ask the, the grad school to provide instructions to you on how to do that. So that's a, that's an easy solution. Uh, just shoot an email to me or, or the grad school. Okay. Um, this is, this student is wondering, is it possible for a student to qualify for a PhD? upon completing without having written a thesis? Uh, yes, but I would say if you, so, okay, I'll back up. Um, you can totally do it. And we've had maybe about 10 ESP students transition into PhD programs. 
Uh, so I, it's, it's definitely doable, but I would say if you're, if you know, you want to go get a PhD, um, a thesis based program that is dedicated to research and doing research specifically in your interest area, uh, would probably put you in a position that would be, uh, you'd have a much better chance of getting into, um, whatever PhD program that you're hoping to, to do after the master's. So we would love to have you. And I don't want to say don't come to ESP, but if you know PhD is in your future, um, a, a program where you're doing research specifically within the focus area that you have, um, is probably going to be a better bet. Couple of questions on housing for grad students. Um, it's my understanding we don't have housing for them, but maybe you can elaborate on anything more. So, Sky, I'm not totally sure. I thought we had graduate housing uh, that was on a lottery system, but I think it's fairly expensive. Uh, I don't, I don't know for sure. Um, okay. Yeah, student but the, services might be able to provide more insight. Yeah, and th there's also. Yes, or Northeastern has, a, I think it cultivates a, a website that links to different housing um, like opportunities. So maybe like lists and things like that. Uh, and then when students get accepted to the program and commit to the program, they often reach out to me and, you know, if they don't have a place, they say, are there any ESP students that are looking for other or for a roommate? Or is there like a ESP house that has a, a vacant slot um, and then I connect them with people. So that's that's an opportunity as well. Um, and then just if you wanna share a good email address that students can contact you directly at with um, follow-up questions also. Okay, I'm putting it in there right now. While we're kind of hanging out here, I will say for international students, it's really helpful to start your visa process as early as humanly possible. Um, so we don't have any control of the visa process in terms of like the, the issuance of visas. And sometimes students aren't successful getting a visa their first time or even their second time, but they might their third time. So the sooner you start the process and go through that process, um, the, the sooner you'll have some answer and then you can make decisions based on that. What is considered a high GPA? So we don't, so I mentioned a lot of our students have a high GPA. I think the average GPA or our, our mean ESP GPA is 3.5, uh, but we don't select solely on, on GPA. We select on GPA, we select on the letters of re recommendation, the your your cover letter or your letter letter of intent, and then we also look at your resume and look at you know what have you done, and especially for people who've been out of school for a long time, their GPA and academic performance is much less important at that point because they have this whole other realm of experience that should be considered as much as you know their their academic performance as well. So it really is dependent on the person uh, that how we you know, make our selections process. One thing I should also mention that I didn't for is um, we do not accept or consider GREs. So if a student has taken a GRE, sorry, <laughs> the GRE process is painful, um, but we don't, we don't want it. We don't look at it. We don't need it. If you submit it, we won't even consider it. So uh, that's hopefully good news to anyone that's wondering whether they need to take the GRE or not. Question here, if you are employed by Northeastern, can you also do a work study? Um, that is unknown. I would say- Yeah, I heard that one. 
Yeah, I hadn't heard that one before. Really? I think it's going to vary. Yeah, I hadn't heard that question. I don't know the answer to that. Good question. Well, it, so I have a feeling the answer is no, but um, which is the bad news. But the good news is if you're a Northeastern employee, you can complete the program for free. So, um, yeah, Appro shoot me an email. We'll set up a meeting to talk about it. I see a question here about class registration. So if you have committed to the program, uh, the the registration has opened up as of yesterday. Uh, if you haven't talked to me yet, schedule a meeting. And I think I've reached out to most people uh, who have committed. But we'll, we'll have a meeting. We'll talk about classes. But you're free to register now. You do it through your, your student, um, your portal. Uh, so within your student portal, I think you go to, I don't, I can't see it from my side of things, so I don't know exactly what it looks like, but I think you go to a resources tab and then within resources tab, there's a registration option there. Um, I see, Sky, let me know if I missed any of these, but I, I can see the, the bottom uh, chat entries here. It says, if nothing on my resume is connected to the environment, to environmental studies, will that hurt me? Um, not necessarily. Uh, it's, it's nice to, so one of the things that we do look at when we're considering a, a student for admission is um, whether they'll flourish in the program. So you don't necessarily have to have a strong background in environmental science. We do have people coming into the program who have a, a undergraduate degree in something very different and they've maybe even worked in that focus area uh, and they've decided they don't like it. And so those, those people are interested in making some sort of transition. Uh, and so we're, we're happy to help with that. We have taken on people that are you know, focused on, had an undergraduate focus on something very different. Uh, but we want to have some assurance that you will do well in the program. Uh, we don't want people to get into the program and then not do well and be dismissed from the program. That's the last thing that we want. So we like to see that people, if they don't have any uh, previous exposure, have done well in classes so that we know, okay, they're able to, 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 handle uh, academically rigorous coursework. Yeah. And then the other question is, do you recommend recommendation letters from people that have master's degree in general or should they be connected with environmental studies mainly? Not necessarily. Um, it's good to have professional references over personal references. Uh, so people that can talk about your, either your academic skills, your research skills, your professional work skills, things like that. So their their provenance or what their background is is not necessarily critical. It's it's more critical that these people can talk about you. Um, I've seen some some recommendation letters that were like three sentences long, uh, and it's really hard to 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 guess why a recommendation letter would be three sentences long. But presumably, that the recommender didn't really know that person very well. So that's obviously like not a good letter, right? So someone who can really talk to you, who you are um, is, is probably the most important. Uh, this person says, can we have a guide on how to register for courses, which, which, so yeah, so I don't know if I, this person came in after I just said that, but um, reach out to me if you're gonna register and, and we can talk about that. I think that's probably the, the easiest. Uh, the next one is for international students, is is it a visa before admission or a mission before visa? Um, they're, they're concurrent. I would say, um, I, yeah, you probably don't want to go, I don't think they even let you get a visa until you have an acceptance letter, but you probably don't want to start that process until you're accepted either because the visa process is kind of arduous. So I'd say submit, we turn around our, our um, the review process really fast. So if you submit, let's say today, it takes a little bit of time for admissions to process your application. But once it gets to us, the, the committee, um, we usually look at it at least weekly, if not 
daily. Uh, and so we try to turn around our decisions within a day or two. So uh, hopefully you can get from start to finish, you can get um, a decision within three weeks, but hopefully even faster than that too, if, if everything is going great. I think we've got all the questions in the chat. We have a couple more minutes. If anybody wanted to come off mute and ask a question directly. Um, I had a quick one. So I know there's quite a lot of courses. Do you have like a percentage breakdown of how many are offered at night for uh, those thinking about doing the program part-time? Yep. I don't know. I Well, yes and no. I don't have a specific breakdown, but I will give you, hold on, I'm looking for, Cool little thing that we have. Okay. I'll pull this up as well. Um, Thank you. It will take me a second to navigate to it. I guess I suppose I could just click on the link as well. Okay. So what this is that I threw into the chat box is a resource that we provide for students uh, and it helps them with with course selection but uh, prospective students usually like it as well because it gives a, a good sense of, of what's up can you guys see this yeah okay yeah for some reason i can't see that it's sharing so great okay so this this tab is all of the core esp courses for fall uh, and you can go back in time in summer spring fall 23 summer 23 etc see what's offered um, and so it's it's divided it's into right. College of Science courses on the top and then uh, policy courses underneath. So almost every science course is offered in person. Um, that might be not surprising. You know, a lot, a lot of the work that we do, we're going out in the field or things like that. Uh, but in the policy school, uh, it's a little different. And most of the policy classes, so just like take any class, I'll just highlight uh, principles of public administration. They offer one in-person class, most policy classes. So the policy school is a graduate school only. Um, so we have, there's a lot of professionals that are taking coursework and um, you know working at the same time. So most of the classes are offered in the evening. So this one is offered once a week from 5 to 5.15 to 8.35. Um, and then you also have the option of doing an online asynchronous class, which means um, you you watch videos, you do the coursework. There are time like, like deadlines, uh, but you can choose to do you know focus on on the work like on the weekend or in the evening or whatever works best for you. And most of the classes have that dual listing um, kind of setup. Yeah, so this is super useful for people. So yeah, check it out, and it gives you a sense too of you know the frequency of offerings and things like that. And one other thing I should note, um, so on the bottom here, these are courses outside our department that sound kind of interesting. And this is not a comprehensive list of courses, but it just is designed or meant to give you a sense of what's out there and to get you interested to go look for more. There's tons of courses that could be interesting. So. Uh, political science, sociology, criminology, economics, uh, philosophy, English, landscape, architecture, data analysis, engineering, journalism, um, what is this, uh, something in the business school, uh, just lots of different courses out there that are either tangentially or directly related to, to environmental studies or your kind of interest area. So yeah, dig into that. Uh, there's a lot of good stuff in there. There's also That's on the perfect. first tab. Oh, great. Also on the first tab, there's a list of syllabi or links to syllabi for almost all classes. So if you're super interested in a specific class, there, hopefully there's a syllabi there. You can check it out. Thank you. And I don't, I don't think you actually put that in the chat. Um, maybe oh, sorry. I, I, enter. I, <laughs> set, I sent it to a direct message here. So let me, Okay. sorry guys. Uh, let's see if this works. Okay. Try that. There we go. Yeah, thanks for letting there us you go. Yep, that's it, Dot. Perfect. 
Um, yeah. We have a question here. Are NOAA and NEAQ on um, your list of co-ops? Oh, NOAA and what was the other now? The other acronym? NEAQ. I don't know what that is. Um, I don't know if we have a NOAA co-op or not. I suspect we might, but I'm not positive. That's a good question. But like I mentioned before, um, in cases where we don't have co-ops, there's a potential that we could develop a co-op for that specific area. Uh, the, the federal um, government is- this, Go ahead. So the other one is the New England Aquarium. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. There's a whole bunch for the New England Aquarium. And so we have people that are like, if you've ever been there or if you haven't been there, the aquarium is like three or four stories and there's this giant tank in the middle and then around it on the first floor, or kind of in the basement of the first floor, it's all open air and it's this penguin enclosure. And there's like a million penguins and these rocks and stuff. And so there's lots of co-ops to be the penguin person where you're just down there hanging out with penguins and cleaning the, they have to continuously like clean up stuff and penguins are like jumping over the top of you and just being penguins is pretty crazy. But there's a bunch of other opportunities at the aquarium as well. But back to uh, NOAA. So NOAA is a, a massive uh, federal or, um, agency and I don't know specifically, but, you know, they, they do meteorology, they do science, they do enforcement, they do impl implementation, they do a lot of different stuff. So um, depending on your interest area, we could definitely try to develop something with NOAA if it was here. Oh, Savannah says they love penguins. Uh, yeah, who doesn't love penguins? Uh, just curious about how many applications do you receive for, for this program? I don't know. I think we've had, I don't know, maybe 300 so far. I, I, I'm just, actually, Sky, do you remember? We just had a meeting and we talked about that, but. I know, we just look at all the numbers blend together when we look at last year, it, this year, this coming spring. It was like a billion numbers though. So if you remembered yes. that number, I would be very surprised. Yes, but. There are enrollments for all terms opened up. Um, fall of next year will be opening in August. So if you're just at the beginning phase of considering um, submitting an application for this program, there will be fall for next fall, fall 25, will be opening in August. And we do have um, applications still open for fall 24 and spring 25. Um, yeah. And I think we are about at time here. Let me, um, let me so just gonna, answer this yeah. one thing, Sky. Sorry to interrupt you. So Savannah said, assuming it's better to apply sooner rather than later. So um, I would say the sooner, so we try to turn, it's rolling, uh, rolling admission. So if you apply now, you'll find out now and you can sign up now. Um, sooner is always better than later, uh, but specifically for ESP, the sooner you enroll, the sooner you can register for classes. And classes, especially the ones that everybody wants to take, will fill up. So the sooner you enroll and register, the greater the chances are that you'll get the specific classes that you want. So yeah. Thanks for the positive words, Taylor. Uh, Hubba says, uh, can I apply for the program? Absolutely. Yeah, please do. I'd love to consider you. And final reminder, for those that have not applied yet, COS Webinar 2024 um, to get that application in there. And I'm going to pass it back to Kenyatta to close us out. Thank you so much, Sky. Doc, any final words, any final departing words of encouragement for these potential Northeastern students? Uh, I'd say final words are ESP is a great program. We usually have around 40 people in the program, but it feels much smaller because we really try to foster community. Uh, we would love to consider you. We would love to fold you into our community. Any questions whatsoever, reach out to me. 
I'm more than happy to schedule meetings uh, over Zoom. I think we can talk to each other face to face. Uh, and thanks everybody for coming and listening. Really appreciate it. Thanks so much, everybody. Have a great day. Thank you for joining us. Thank, Thank you. you. All.